I'm often asked, who were your teachers? I've had many, many, many teachers. You know, when a human being first begins to wake up and uh, he wants to go on a spiritual path, I was very blind. Reason is, as I have said many times before, I was agnostic at very best. There was no religion in my life and uh, I didn't even understand the word spirituality. You know, on a very bad day when there was some bad news coming from the world, I was an um, entrenched atheist. But when the desire for a greater expression rose in my heart and my mind, I looked for teachers. It's not easy to find a teacher. I used to long for a teacher who could come and um, be my guru. Guru is very different from a teacher and the difference has to be understood. Guru is a beautiful word. Teacher is somebody who teaches you that which is known. A syllabus, uh, something that's in a book. Teacher usually also gets paid for the work that they do. And they are always teaching you about materiality, about the world around you. So there is a definitiveness. Um, a grade 10 teacher of math will teach you grade 10 math. A grade 12 science teacher will teach you grade 12 science. So there is a curriculum and uh, that's all they have and that's what they teach. But a guru is a beautiful word. Why is it beautiful? Because it implies something. Guru stands for he who dispels darkness. He who takes darkness away. And what is darkness but ignorance? Not knowing who we are. A teacher that points you in the direction of who you are and what you are doing on this planet Earth and what is your purpose and all of the other things. Teacher points you in the right direction. Teacher points you towards God. Teacher points you towards your own divinity. I used to long for a teacher. I used to pine. I used to yearn for a teacher. Uh, I used to write a journal and my journal has many, many entries asking God to send me a teacher, a teacher that I can relate to and, uh, and have a rapport with and somebody who can have an effect on me that is beyond words and but it was difficult I my journey was not to have one teacher I did not know that at time my journey was to have lots of teachers and learn from lots of places and whatever wisdom knowledge knowing I have gained I gained it from all of these fine teachers so early on when I was thirsty, a book came in my life. A book was called Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius is the great Caesar, probably the first great Caesar that uh, Rome ever had. He was not only a warrior, but he was also a general, also a spiritualist. And his writings are all in the book called Meditations. It was a gift from my friend and, uh, and it's written in, in a journal form. Sometimes he writes in the middle of battles. Sometimes he is on an excursion to quell a rebellion somewhere. So he had a persona and, uh, and character of Caesar, but internally when he wrote to himself, he was a great writer, a spiritualist. And his spirituality was unaffected by, by Christianity yet, because Christianity had not taken a hold in Europe yet. He comes from a Stoic philosophy, from the ancient uh, Greek. I read his book and it kind of gave me a glance of who I wanted to be and where I wanted to be. Uh, you know, I encourage anybody who has not read Meditations, it, it's a book that should be kept at your night table. And it's very easy to read because you don't have to read it. It doesn't go 
uh, one by one, it's just his entries. Today I feel like this, today I amused about this, today I found out this. So it's a very easy one to learn. Another Lebanese poet came in my life, a beautiful Lebanese poet uh, by the name of Khalil Gibran. And if you ever get a chance, you should read his book, The Prophet. He taught me more about my mindset regarding charity, regarding how to give selflessly. And he also wrote a lot of short, short stories that are very poignant and, and hit the spot. So Khalil Gibran and his poetic words brought a lot into my life. There's another poet from India, uh, Rabindranath Tagore, um, lived in the times before 1947. Uh, he won a Nobel Peace Prize for his book, Gitanjali. Beautiful song, the songs of the divine. Uh, beautiful, beautiful book. His pining, his yearning for God, and um, him knocking at this door of God and, uh, and his, um, his own inabilities to reach there. He has um, very beautiful words. Uh, Rabindranath Tagore had a huge impact on me. Similarly, as I was starting out, these were the books that came in my life at a very early stage of my spirituality and basically tilled my soil for greater expansion. Another book that came in my life was Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. Gifted man, I started understanding what now is, now and here. There's another writer who is a little bit less known. His name is Michael Singer. His two books came in my life. One was called The Untethered Soul, incredible book uh, of his own journey and what he discovered. And then later he wrote another book called The Surrender Experiment. Absolutely beautiful books. While this was happening, a great teacher came in my life and his name is Osho. Bhagwan Rajneesh to some, but Osho to the most of the world. In my humble opinion, in Western society, he is very misunderstood. He was a little bit too advanced for his times. Yes, I've, I've seen most of the um, uh, videos around him, but I tell you that if you go to the core of Osho and listen to his recordings and what he is saying, Indians say that his throat, Ma Saraswati, lives there the goddess of uh, speech, the goddess of arts. It lives in his throat. He speaks so well that it is, um, it is a treat. And uh, Osho came in my life at the right time. He gave, uh, gave me direction, gave me a bearing, uh, something that I could always fall back on, something that um, I could always rely on. Um, absolutely floored by Osho. If you're on a path of spirituality, there is one, um, one holy book that almost everybody has to read, and that is called the Bhagavad Gita. It is a dialogue between Lord Krishna, who himself was a warrior, a king, a spiritual being, and Arjun, who is now preparing to go to war against an army of his cousins. Arjun is having a difficulty going and fighting his cousins. And there's a dialogue and the whole book of Bhagavad Gita is a dialogue between Krishna and uh, this warrior. So it's a very unique setting because it's this early in the morning and the war is about to begin and Arjuna is saying, I don't want to fight. And Bhagavad Gita taught me more about my daily conduct, what I needed to be, who I needed to be, how I needed to make my whole life into 
worship, how I turn my daily life, what I do on a daily basis into spiritual practice. Um, incredible psychological book that helps you in your journey towards the divine. Um, Bhagavad Gita's basic concept and Christian spells it out is that there are four different ways of reaching God. One is all the deeds that you do, karma yoga. Um, the other one is wisdom, to gain insight, wisdom. The other one is love, devotion. Purify your love, make a channel divine, make it um, uh, an offering to divine. And the last one obviously is meditation, dhyan. And um, that book here taught me more about where I needed to be. And I shall always be grateful to Lord Krishna and or whoever wrote uh, Bhagavad Gita. I was born in a Sikh family in, uh, in Northern India. Um, I, my family was uh, not, not Orthodox, but we, were, we had a religious household. I left that place at age 14, but I remember our, this being a Sikh, the founder of Sikhism is Guru Nanak Dev Ji. And obviously as a child, his teachings resonated in me. I found out much later that as a youngster, I used to be very spiritual. I would stand on one leg uh, and, and make uh, do do the prayers and I did not know how to do the entire book of prayers but the first verse I had that memorized and somebody said Dave um, as a youngster somebody told me if you do that hundred times that equals as if you have read, done the whole um, holy holy recital and I would stand on one leg and recite that hundred times as a youngster but Guru Nanak Dev Ji, I got to appreciate him even more when, when spirituality ignited in me. And I wanted an expression of my heart. All my life, I had lived this life of a macho man because that's all I was taught. Um, I, was, I always felt tears, love. Um, these, were, these were feminine creatures things for you and you don't cry, you don't uh, do these things and you always are tough. I, I remember not crying because of this thing that was drilled into me. But Guru Nanak Dev Ji taught me that I must embrace my feminine side also, which is represented by love, devotion. And uh, I knew that I needed to bring that in me. And Guru Nanak Dev Ji wrote such beautiful, yearning poetry for God. Um, his whole thing was about yearning for God. Because that yearning, that thirst for God, is, what, is, the, is the fuel that propels you towards the divine. A certain amount of thirst is needed to reach divine. As a matter of fact, I'll say, your thirst equals the progress that you will make. And uh, because we are too much caught up in the world. And if you don't have a thirst for divine, it is hard to make room for divine in your life. And Guru Nanak Dev Ji taught me that. And I shall always be grateful to him. Another Sikh Guru that had a huge, huge impact on me was Guru Gobind Singh Ji. But before I go into Guru Gobind Singh Ji, it is very important that his father, Guru Teik Bahadur Ji, should also be mentioned here. Guru Teik Bahadur Ji eventually became the ninth Guru. But before he became ninth Guru, he, d he was not prepared to be the Guru. But what had happened is after 8th Guru passed away, there was a vacuum. And many, many people were professing to be the next Guru. 
uh, Sikh gurus were very well respected and a lot of uh, money used to be um, uh, donated in their names. And so it was a very uh, sort of um, money thing. So many, many gurus, wannabe gurus were professing to be gurus. But there was a uh, Muslim a businessman. And there's, this is a story related to Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji and how he was discovered. Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji wanted to meditate, but family got him married at a very, very young age. Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji went into meditation. He built this little, um, little cave-like room, which was very dark, very quiet in his own home. And he would go in there to meditate all the time, meditate all the time. His wife was a very pious wife and she stood by him. Yeah, in an unconsummated marriage, she stood by him while he meditated for 25 years. So this is a scenario. The Muslim gentleman was very fond of Sikh gurus. He was coming back on this, um, this ship with his cargo and the ship ran into a storm. And obviously he's praying for his own life and his cargo, thinking that he will be ruined. Uh, he was praying, he prayed to Sikh gurus also and said, hey, if you save me from this, I will donate 500 gold coins if, I, if, if you can save me for, from this. As it would have it that his ship, his cargo, and he were saved. And they made it safely back, back home. Now he comes back to this Punjab area where the gurus used to live. And now he's trying to find who is the next living guru. And uh, everywhere he goes, everybody is professing to be the next guru, next teacher. So everywhere he would go, everywhere he would go and he would bow to whoever was professing to be the next guru and he would always put down five gold coins while doing his salutations. And uh, the, all the gurus that were basically after people who would just donate to them were very happy and they wanted him. But he knew there was something missing that he knew that these people are just after money. So he went to lots of places and everywhere he would put down five coins, five coins, five coins. Eventually he heard of this man who is meditating in his home. And it was a known, known in that village that he, he is a true guru. But Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji had never professed himself to be such. And he was just busy meditating and uh, the wife was always there. He said, I'm going to go see that man. So this Muslim businessman goes to the house and asks the wife that I would like to see Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji. And she said, no, he's in a meditation. Then he tried to tell her how far he has traveled, how many places he has been to. And eventually the, um, Guru Tegh Bahadur's wife had mercy on him and she said yes no problem you can come and see him and she takes him to his little cave uh, where he was uh, guru was meditating and he goes inside bows and he again puts down five gold coins in front of him and bows to him and guru smiled at him and guru said you promise 500, yet you only give five. What kind of bargain do you drive? Right away, this Muslim merchant knew he had found the true Guru because he had never told the story of 500 coins that he promised. Guru was not after his coins, but this is how a Guru made himself known to this Muslim merchant. Muslim merchant convinced Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji that he should come out now. Why? Because there were too many false shops being set up under his name. So it is said that Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji came out and resumed his familiar responsibilities. He, he became a husband 
and um, Guru Gobind Singh Ji was born to this couple. Such a pious womb, a woman that is serving her husband who is meditating for 25 years. Basically, best part of her youth is spent serving. And this man who has meditated for 25 years. Only a womb like that is worthy of having a child like Guru Gobind Singh Ji. Guru Gobind Singh Ji, in his own words, says something beautiful. In his own words, he was also a great poet, great writer, um, spiritually enlightened, born enlightened. He says this in his own words. He goes, I am uh, Das. I am devoted to divine with love in my heart. I am his servant. And I have come to this earth to see this play of life. And in that same hymn, he then goes on to say that in my previous life, I used to be a king in the hills of a kingdom. And then I resigned myself and went off into the hills. And I was meditating in a cave on nothingness, on Kal, which means death and or nothingness. He was meditating on that. And eventually when he went upstairs, the God said, I have one more mission for you. And he came back as the last, the 10th Guru of Sikhs. Why do I admire Guru Gobind Singh Ji is for one very simple reason. He was a family man. He was a father, he was a husband, he was a son. Yet he was supremely spiritual. And uh, not only that, he was a warrior. He was a warrior, a general who fought against the tyranny of times. And uh, that alone, you know, to be able to balance all of these things. I always loved teachers that could balance spirituality with daily grind. And it's daily grind that overcomes, overpowers all of us. And uh, spirituality kind of gets pushed to the side. But these beautiful teachers, Guru Gobind Singh Ji, Guru Nanak Dev Ji was also married, had children. Um, even Krishna, even Marcus Aurelius. And I was always trying to find a balance in my own life. Because I had become a businessman. And I'm trying to find a balance. Where does my spirituality and how do I bring it into my life and how do I give it the most, uh, the foremost position in my life, the spirituality. So these teachers taught me a lot. Another teacher who helped open my heart is Jesus Christ. I'm not a Christian, but I love Jesus Christ. I can say that. One saying of his got me started to, that I needed to get to know this man a little bit more, was he said something very strange. He said, it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to go to heaven. I have spent my whole life trying to get ahead in my life. Get, make some money, get rich, have a little bit of a name. And here is this man who is saying, you got no chance, young man. You got no chance. And I, he intrigued me. And I said, I will get to know what he means by this a bit more. I understood then, richness doesn't always have to be about money. You can be rich in vanity. You can be rich in ego. You can be rich in uh, envy, in jealousy. I also learned that, yes, I might be given certain things, money, but I, can, I should not possess money. 
I can have the use of money, but it is my possessing of money, my miserliness with money that makes me rich. And it makes me all about money. I respect money, but I do not love money. That's what I learned from Jesus. Then along the same path, then he came and he taught me something about abundance. Another one of his sayings, which is so anti-communist, which you think a spiritual person should be for the masses. And he says something like this. Those who have much more shall be added on to them. And those who do not have, that which they have shall be taken away. Oh my God, if that's not uh, slapping a poor person at the, on the face of it, then what is? You know, if you don't have, even whatever you have will be taken away. And if you have, much more shall be added on to you. Then I realize he's talking about abundance. See, you can live a life saying, I need this, I need that, I need that, I need that, I need that. I know some people who live in $20 million homes and are not happy, still trying to acquire something else. I know women who have a selection of beautiful purses, yet they are not happy because she doesn't have Louis Vuitton purse. I know people who have more jewelry than they can remember. But yet every time they see a piece of new jewelry, they want that. I know people who have clothes to last this lifetime and the next and the next. But yet they continue to buy more and more clothes. Something have gone wrong here. These people have much but yet their need for more and more will always keep them poor. But yet, then you have somebody else who might only have a medium amount of stuff or a reasonable amount of stuff, yet they're happy. Yet they're happy. They're happy in the one bedroom apartment. They're happy with uh, five sets of clothes that they have. They're happy. They're happy with not having any jewelry. No jewelry. Um, so Jesus taught me all of these things about abundance to, to have a mindset of contentment that I have. What I need, I have. I have enough air, I have enough water, I have enough food. When you have enough, you will always have enough. And when you don't have enough, you'll always be not enough. And Jesus taught me that. Now the next saying by Jesus Christ, which a lot of Christians miss. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God within. Before you do anything else, first seek the kingdom of God within. If he is not asking you to meditate, then I don't know what, how, how he can say it. He's asking, close your eyes, go within. There is a kingdom of God within. Discover it. Once you know that kingdom, the world outside changes. So his first instructions to if you follow Jesus Christ should be taken to heart. Then he says another something beautiful, which uh, I also learned from him. Me and my father are one. Me and my father are one. I am the son of God. He is not saying that you are not a son of God. He is not saying all the other people are not sons of gods and daughters of God. He is saying, I am. To come to a realization that the God I seek outside is also within me is the highest realization any spiritual being can have. That God that I seek is in me. I am same as him. I am his creation created by his material. I am of him, in him, 
about him. He taught me that. Another part of Jesus Christ, it came that the people of, time, of those times could not, um, could not uh, stomach him and his revolutionary words and revolutionary ideas. And he was eventually uh, sentenced to die by crucifixion. And this is where I find Jesus amazing is these guys are driving nails, spikes into his feet and into his hands. And the words that come out of his mind are, forgive them, Father, for they do not know what they do. Here he is. He's not saying, God, strike them down. He is saying, forgive them. Because they're ego drunk. They're drunk. They're drunk in power. They're drunk in everything. They don't understand. You, God, forgive them. The question of Jesus forgiving them is not even there. He is saying, God, you forgive them also. What type of love would this man have in his heart? I aspire for that type of love. If I could even touch this much of that, I'd be redeemed. And then when he is crucified and he is there and he is in pain and suffering, he questions God because it's another thing to die, but to die being tortured in the prime of your life and to die in a, such a torturous way. And through his pain and suffering, he questions God. Why have you abandoned me, God? You know, doesn't matter you're a spiritual person or a child of God, your body, when these horrible things are happening to it, you will suffer. And then he collects himself. And this is the beauty of it. And he realizes that today, this universe, God will be served by my death. And he goes, let thy will be done. He is not questioning no more. He is saying, your will today is that this Jesus should die. And I die. Surrender. Such beautiful, beautiful things. Another teacher. A while back, a few years back, 15 years back, I had a chance to visit um, Calcutta, uh, me and my son. And uh, we ended up uh, in uh, uh, Mother Teresa's place, where she is, uh, I think her tomb is there, and the place where she used to live. And, uh, this, and they have even preserved the room that she used to live in. Very sparse, one bed, one cross, one very small table and a chair. That's all that was in her room. But that place, I have never resonated in the feeling of love like I resonated in her room. I sat there with tears streaming from my cheeks and I felt such love such beautiful love like I have never felt before. Her ability to share of herself and give of herself makes her my teacher. And I learn from her all the time. Another teacher, also from that part of the world, Calcutta, I had a chance to visit his um, ashram, Shri Ramakrishnan. Shri Ramakrishnan was not very well known, but one of his disciples became very well known. A um, person named is Swami Vivekananda. Swami Vivekananda was a handsome uh, spiritual man who went all over Western world in back closer to the turn of the last century. And uh, he brought Indian spirituality to all of these places. And 
through him, people discovered who his teacher is. And his teacher was this uh, uneducated, born in a village man called Shri Ramakrishnan. Shri Ramakrishnan uh, got followed by a bunch of university students and Swami Vivekananda was one of them. And all of these became enlightened teachers in their own rights. But one of the students decided that he is going to start taking down what Shri Ramakrishnan is saying all the time. And he wrote uh, at least a thousand if not 1200 page uh, gospel of Shri Ramakrishnan, which is all basically his sayings that he recorded. Uh, he would take down notes, go home, uh, transcribe them and have them all printed in that. There's a beautiful story that Shri Ramakrishnan used to tell and it had a lot of, um, it had a bearing on me. Shri Ramakrishnan used to tell a story of Chaitanya. Chaitanya was also a son of a business family and then he left to be, to chase his spirituality. And yet, the problem with the businessman is that business is always in his head and it takes a while to get the business out of the head. Chaitanya had 125 uh, teachers, gurus. He would turn every situation, every thing that he saw into a learning possibility. One of his teachers used to be a bird called Kite. Uh, the kites are these, um, they're like seagulls. Um, they're like uh, cranes on the Indian subcontinent. They, when they're flying up in the heavens, they look like kites. And, um, but they always lived just by the seashore or close to the rivers. One day Chaitanya, the story Sri Ramakrishnan tells is Chaitanya was sitting on the bank of river Ganges and watching fishermen fishing and fishermen had cast a net and they were trying to gather it all and the fish were sort of jumping in, up and down. This kite which was flying way high decided that he's going to have some fish. So he swoops down, swoops down and opens his beak and picks up two, three fishes and start swooping up again and to go back up and go and eat it someplace quiet. But as he's flying back up, there's a band of crows sitting on a tree near the river Ganges. All these crows look up and they see this kite has a lot of fish in his mouth. A lot of fish in his mouth. These band of crows said, hey, let's go and take a few from him. He's got a bunch. Let's go chase him wherever he goes. He's going to sit down sometime. Let's go chase. So the poor kite goes this way and this band of crows is chasing him. He goes this way, that way, this way, that way. And the, but the band of crows are not going to let him go. Eventually the kite, this bird, gets tired and starts huffing and puffing. And it opens its mouth while flying. And these fish start falling moment the crows realize that, hey, he doesn't have any fish in his mouth, they let him go and they start chasing the fish down. Chaitanya, Saint Ch Chaitanya learned a great lesson from him. He goes, as long as I have a lot of things in my mouth, money, jobs, job, um, so where people can make use of me, I'll always be chased. I must drop the fish out of my mouth so that I can have my peace and solace. It applied to me. It applied to me because I was trying to be this guy that is wanted and needed. And yet I was getting busier and busier with more phone calls and more phone calls and more contacts and more contacts. And I needed to let a few fish out of my mouth. So Shri Ramakrishnanji taught me this, this and a lot more other wisdom from him I gained. Another person that um, came in my life 
as a teacher was Swami Yogananda, Paramahansa Yogananda. He was first one to come to California and set up um, an ashram there. Uh, his book, Autobiography of a Yogi, was distributed at the funeral of Steve Jobs. To every person that attended Steve Jobs' uh, funeral, the book, a copy of that book was given out. I, I've read his books and uh, I learned a lot from him. Humility personified, humility personified, reverence for teachers personified. There's even um, a rumor or there is a legend around that book that whoever reads that book ends up having, while he's reading the book, a certain spiritual experience that gives them something. Um, I am, I did have a spiritual experience while I read that book and it's, it's a little bit beyond, but it opens your mind to other possibilities. So Swami uh, Paramahansa Yogananda, very much my teacher. Now you cannot be a sp spiritual seeker and not run into Gautam Buddha, the great Buddha. Buddha is the scientist of inner world. He never asks you to abandon your intellect, which a lot of religions tend to do. They tend to ask you to have faith without providing any reason to have faith. Buddha doesn't do that. He says, bring your intellect to the game. And that I liked. By far, more people have been enlightened following Buddha's path than any other path. He was a scientist of inner world. Uh, he is a scientist of how to go beyond mind, how to experience moksha, freedom. When a meditation became a major part of my life, many times I went for Vipassana camps. I have been to many, many Vipassana camps where it's a 10 day uh, meditation, totally quiet. You're meditating up to 10 hours a day. Learned a lot. Learned a lot about myself, the mind and uh, Buddha, Buddha's teachings I always fall back on. Uh, he is always there as a guide to me. Uh, I pay reverence to him every day. Uh, as a matter of fact, all the teachers I have so far said I pay reverence. Another great teacher, which Chinese in nature, Lao Tzu. It's amazing how many Chinese people have never heard of Lao Tzu, but a great Buddha indeed, an enlightened soul. It is said that he became enlightened in his late teens. As a 19 year old, he became enlightened, lying on a bed on a hot summer day outside uh, under a tree and he just watched this dry leaf disconnect from the tree and just drift down drifting while drifting he got enlightened sometimes some people had done so much work in their previous lives that whenever a moment comes in their present life just a very little tap is all that's needed for them to become enlightened. And he was enlightened at age 19, just watching a leaf drift down. Great teacher. He, he lived a very, um, very low-key life. He was an archivist in the, in the king's uh, palace, and he would keep the books and all that. But he also had a following. A lot of people followed him. One day when he was old, it was time for him to leave. And as he was leaving, he packed his belongings and he wanted to go into the mountains to, to die. That's, that's the story. He knew his time was coming and he wanted to die in the mountains, not in a city. So as he was leaving, he runs into this sentry at the gate. You know, the all Chinese cities, especially with palaces in them, used to have 
walls. And uh, this sentry was his follower also. And the sentry is doing his job. He goes, I will not let you leave. He goes, why won't you let me leave? He goes, you are a mountain of knowledge. You cannot leave without sharing that knowledge or leaving something with us. So it is said that Lao Tzu wrote Tao Te Ching, beautiful book, only 82 verses, 82 pages. It's not very big, but it became a founding book for Taoism or Taoism. Um, he first coined the phrase Tao. Um, when he sensed that there is something called God, uh, with what we call God, he didn't have a name for it. He goes, for the lack of other words, I will just call it Tao. And this 82 page book I recommend to everybody. I think I have read at least six or seven different um, translations of it because his words are ancient, probably three to 4,000 years old. His words are ancient and some of those words have lost uh, words to explain and different and because it's in Chinese and it's not my native language I needed translation by many different people to make sense of his words and beautiful beautiful teachings. Another teacher that came in my life and whose teachings resonate in me is a gentleman from Jan tr tradition. His name is Mahavir. Mahavir uh, came from a minor principality. Uh, he was a young prince, but he always had this desire to go and be alone. But in the old days, his mother was alive. She won't let him leave. She made him swear by her that you can't leave. So he said, I won't leave. He was married off thinking that that will take his mind off being a spiritual seeker who just goes off into the forest and, and the world. She said, while I am alive, you will not go do that. He's, you know, being a good son, he obeyed his mother. And after mother died, he approached his elder brother saying, hey, my mother has gone and this is what I want to do. Even his brother did not agree to it. And it is said that Mahavir basically checked out of the world while staying at the house. Eventually it dawned upon his brother that, hey, maybe I should let him go. You know, if his heart lies somewhere else, I should let him go. And it's a tradition in India that if you are ready to take sannyas, sannyasis are basically you are giving up the world and the worldly ways and now you shall go and live with the nature with almost no possessions. So it used to be a tradition in those days that if somebody is going to be, uh, become a sannyasi, that he would give away all of his belongings. So he will put them all out and people would come, beggars would come, people would come from far away who needed clothing, who needed bedding. They will come and they will take everything. When all the clothes and everything was taken, he was left with one shawl. One shawl is all that he had and he kept that wrapped around himself and he was leaving. He was outside of the village and this man comes running to him. Hey, hey, I hear this, uh, this guy, he is uh, taking a sannyas and uh, he is giving everything away. Mahavir said, young man, you're too late. You, you've taken too long, everything has been taken. And he saw the disappointment on the face of this man. And Mahavir cut his shawl in two. In the old days, cl clothing, we are talking 2000 years ago, 2500 years ago, clothing was well, uh, uh, was quite expensive regardless. He gave him half of the shawl, he kept half of the shawl and gave him to say, this is all that's left, you can have half. He took half and Mahavir went his way. First night out in wilderness, Mahavir slept in just the open fields and um, 
his shawl in the morning, by morning, had got tangled up in a thorn bush. And he tried to take it out and he got stung by a couple of thorns and all that. And he felt like this thorn bush wants to keep his shawl. He said, okay, you can have my shawl. Mahavir became naked after that. He never put on clothes after that. The ability to not possess anything was amazing. Now, because he was naked, and whenever he would go to any village or asking for food, people would shoo him away. Some people would be even much meaner than that, throw rocks at him, say, hey, you are crazy, go run away. But they never understood Mahavir. Mahavir, in 12 years, he did lots of penance, a lot of meditation. It is said that in 10 years, he only got food for about 300 nights. 300 days he ate, rest of the days he was hungry all the time. But that was not his major goal. He was this naked spiritual seeker who has nothing. But yet he is today known as Mahavir. Mahavir means the great warrior. Here is emancipated, skinny man you know, with the dust on his body from walking bare feet all the time. And yet he is known as the great warrior. Why is he known as a great warrior? Because he fought his mind and won. How many people get to do that? To win their mind. Guru Gobind Singh Ji says, win your mind, win the world. And this man is called the great warrior who won the battle against his mind. Most of us don't recognize that we are prisoners of our mind. We are prisoners of our mind. Our mind dictates everything that we do. Your mind. We are caught in such ways that we can't even imagine because we never look at it. We always have had mind, so we never see the prison that we are in. Only very gifted few people get to see their mind and the programming and the conditioning and the I and me and mine as a jail. And very few people have the capacity to escape. Mahavir was one of them. Another great Indian saint's teachings came my way. His name is Ashtavakra. Ashtavakra is accredited with another book called Ashtavakra Mahagita. Bhagavad Gita is by Krishna, but Ashtavakra also has a Gita. And unique again is the setting of that Gita, the song of God. Ashtavakar was born with eight abnormalities. It is said that he was crooked in eight different bodies, body parts. He was handicapped. And um, that's why he's called Ashtavakra. Translated, it means he who is bent on eight different places. He was a son of the royal pundit, this Brahmin who was in the court of King Janak. King Janak is known as a spiritual king. He is also the father of Sita. Um, Sita, his wife, eventually became a wife of Ram. Ram and Sita and their story is part of Ramayana. Sita was a daughter of King Janak. So it comes from that lineage and, and this story is that old also. King Janak used to love to invite other scholars and other philosophers to his court and they would all uh, have discussions about the nature of reality, nature of God and spirituality and all of that. His father, being a Brahmin, ate pure vegetarian food, which was only to be cooked by his wife. 
And so this day they were having discussions and the wife, uh, Ashtavakar's mother, sent Ashtavakar with his lunch kit. And Ashtavakar is about eight to 10 years old at this time. He said, go and deliver this lunch kit to your dad. And they were having a big discussion in this court with King being present and in walks in Ashtavakra with uh, lunch kit. And obviously he's hobbling, he's hobbling and making very different types of noises with his feet. And the whole gallery, all the people who had gathered there, these great philosophers and all of that, they started laughing, laughing at this guy's hobbling manner of walking in. When they all stopped laughing, when the laughing subsided, Ashtavakar, who was only eight to 10 years old, started laughing, looking at all of them and started laughing, which is considered very disrespectful. You know, in, on Indian subcontinent, you don't laugh at your elders, especially elders of who are philosophers and in the presence of king. You know, the king was quite upset and king asked him, Hey, young man, why are you laughing at these nice elderly people? He goes, they all profess. They all profess to be great philosophers and knowers of God. They are not that. They are just all leather workers. They are all leather workers. A conference of leather workers is debating principles of spirituality. He goes, what do you mean by that? That they are leather workers. He goes, all they saw in me was my skin, my leather. That's all they saw because that's all they could see. They could not see what's inside of me. And yet these people are talking philosophy, the great things. King was very impressed. It is said the King Janak later sought out these, this young person, went and bowed to him and asked him to be his teacher, to teach him real spirituality because he realized this is an enlightened young man. The dialogue between King Janak, who himself is a fairly advanced spiritual man, and this enlightened person called Ashtavakra, is what came to be known as Ashtavakra Gita. And Ashtavakra has his own way, very different than all the other teachers I have said, but again, he is again a beautiful finger pointing at the same moon that we're all trying to get at. Another saint from the Indian subcontinent that has had a lot of uh, impact on me with purity of his word and simpleness of his words is Kabir. Also Baba Farid and Bulle Shahji. But Kabir is outstanding and he was a poet and um, he was uh, found floating in a, in a river in a basket. Nobody knew if he was Muslim or Hindu but he was admired by both both sides. And he writes such beautiful words that they resonate in me and I can be often found humming his words all the time. Prophet Muhammad is also my teacher. Every person who goes on a spiritual path eventually asks one big question, one, one of the big questions. What is free will? Do I have any free will? If it's God everywhere, what is my free will? In my humble opinion, Prophet Muhammad explained free will to me like I had never been explained before. So it comes, it came across through a story about Prophet Muhammad and one of his disciples. They were traveling. They stopped at this oasis to rest and the disciple asked Prophet Muhammad, what of free will? Do I have any free will? What is free will? Etc. Prophet Muhammad asked him to stand and he stood. And he goes, lift one leg. 
Such simple teaching. He said, just lift one leg and he lifted his leg. Prophet Muhammad asked, did you understand? He goes, no. Okay. Now lift the other leg. Trying to lift the other leg, he had to put down this leg. Before, and he, when he was trying to put it down, Prophet Muhammad said, I said, lift your other leg. I didn't ask you to put the other one down. He goes, I can't do that as long as this leg is off the ground. Simple. Prophet Muhammad again asked him, did you understand now? And the disciple said, no, I did not understand. Then the Prophet Muhammad explained to him. He goes, I only ask you to lift a leg. You decided right or left how high, how low you wanted to lift it. That was entirely up to you. You made a choice. But when you made a choice, you had free will to make that choice, which leg you choose. But after you made a choice to lift your right leg, then the universe decided that you will not be capable of lifting your left leg as long as right leg is in the air. Beautiful way to explain free will. We make a choice based upon our choice. Universe shifts the universe around us. The existence shifts the universe around us. You decide to be mean to somebody, universe now shifts. Other person is given a right to be mean right back to you. Now you decide to be doubly mean now. Now you shift again. You close some doors of possibilities and you keep opening different doors. But the choice, the, you have partial choice, partial free will. But after you have your free will and you choose and you select and you choose your code of conduct, then the universe decides. You decide to do something good. Universe opens a different set of possibilities. And then again, as you move forward, different sets of possibilities are coming forward all the time, allowing you free will. But based upon your choices in life, certain aspects, certain doors become closed. So Prophet Muhammad, taught me that. Sufi saints, many, many Sufi saints came in my life and uh, whose teachings I absolutely adore. Word Sufi is misunderstood. Suf stands for wool. Sufis used to wear, they were basically freewheeling in the Middle East, they were they were lovers of God and they would wear Sufi clothes. Suf meaning woolen clothes. Wool in a desert is hot and the wool would, that, that prickliness of the wool on your skin would constantly be used by them to remind them of God all the time. And that's why they were called Sufis. Now we have Sufi poems, which was Sufi poetry, even borderline things have been described as, as Sufi. But Sufism is, is lover, Sufis are lovers of God. And I learned a lot from Sufi masters, from Baha'u'llah, uh, from, um, uh, you know, Jalaluddin Rumi, from Omar Khayyam, um, Ibrahim, um, many, but um, there's two or three that really, really stand out. Many people have not heard of Shibli. Shibli, I learned something from Shibli. Shibli in his later days, he writes that he was wandering in the desert and he was wandering and searching for God. and he came across an oasis and he was sitting there after he had had his drink resting under um, a bunch of trees and uh, he sees this wild dog come in from the desert 
And this dog is thirsty. His hair are like all over the place and he's super, super thirsty. And he comes to the oasis and he looks down there and there's a little pond. But the moment the dog looks down, he sees his own shadow of this craggly, raggedy old dog. And he starts barking at his own shadow. And the shadow barked back. And uh, the, you know, the dog got scared and he runs away. He does not realize that that's my own shadow that's barking back at me. So Shibli is sitting on the sideline watching this dog. Dog runs away, but his thirst brings him back. He's thirsty, he wants some water. He comes back and he again tries to drink water and he sees this dog standing there and he can't drink and he starts barking, runs away. This happened many times. Eventually the dog was very, very thirsty. Dog goes away, he comes back, he's so thirsty. He says, I don't care, I'm gonna tangle with that shadow that is there, I will tangle. The dog just jumps in to have a sip of water. Shibli learned a great lesson from this. And this lesson played a part in my life also. What do I mean by that? God is that great ocean. And we skirt around God all the time. I did that. You come close, but you don't want to go all the way. You come close and something in you gets afraid and you walk back. You come close, but you don't. There's a pull of society, pull of family, pull of your loved ones, pull of the life that you have lived. And it doesn't allow you to take a leap. And this happens. And this you have to learn about yourself. And eventually he realized that the thirst of the dog was too much. Shibli realized, I have to be like that dog. If I can't take a leap into godliness, if I can't surrender fully, it is because I'm not thirsty enough. I learned a lot from this. Eventually, you have to take a leap into God. And you know that shadow that's barking back at you is just your ego. It is your own shadow. What is ego but your shadow? And you have to go beyond it. You'll have to overcome it. One day, in the lives of all spiritual seekers, a time comes when you have to put your small self your ego self on the altar of sacrifice. You sacrifice ego self so that you may be born into the much greater whole, into the divine self, the big self, godliness. So you may be born as God, in God, but the ego self has to be abandoned at some point. I learned a lot from that. There's another man who played a part in Shibli wandering in desert and seeking God. And that man's name is Mansur. Mansur and Shibli were both students at a madrasa. Madrasa is a spiritual school that their teacher used to run. Uh, his, th their teacher was Junaid, another great enlightened teacher. They were all studying under him spirituality, meditation, uh, Quran, and all of those things. One of the highest realization, almost at the peak of all realizations, is when you discover, and Hindus call it, Aham Brahmashtmi. I am Brahma. Muslims, Sufis, know it as Anal Haq, I am the truth. Jesus Christ knew it as me and my father are one. What it is, is that you reach this, this peak of knowing that the God that I was seeking all my life was inside of me. 
it is inside of me and it is everywhere. The God I seek everywhere is in me. But this doesn't happen in an in a arrogant way. It doesn't happen through knowledge of it. It happens by a deep knowing. Only the humblest get to this realization. Only the humblest, humble, humility, total absence of ego gives birth to this realization. Because ego is as if you're wearing sun, uh, sunglasses. It colors your vision. It colors everything that you see with whatever your conditioning is. But when you take off these glasses and you can see reality for what it is, you seek, you discover that that what you have been seeking all your life is in you. That's the highest achievement. Mansoor, when he was in his most ecstatic self, the words that came out of his mouth is, Anal haq, Anal haq. I am the truth, I am the truth, I am the truth. His teacher, his guru, Junaid, made him give him one promise. He goes, you will never say this again. You will never say it anywhere else other than in my presence. And he says, you need to make me this promise. And it is said that Mansoor made that promise. But a few months later, there was a gathering at King's court. And King had invited lots of spiritual people there, a lot of um, imams and, and prophets and you know all these people who thought they knew God. And there was so much discussion about God, 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 God everywhere that Mansoor fell in trance again, in his ecstatic trance. And he started shouting again, Anal Haq, Anal Haq, Anal Haq. All the priest could not take that. How does this mere human declare himself to be God? This is, this is disrespect at the extreme. They went to king. Mansoor was, threat Mansoor was sentenced to die by crucifixion. And it is said that he was put up on a pole and people were throwing rocks at him because that was used to be one of the more cruel punishments that could be given. People would, uh, this undefended, tied human being would be r rocked. Basically, people would throw rocks at them. And this is a man of the highest spiritual realizations. While he is, this is happening, a lot of Mansoor's fellow students were a little bit afraid. They were afraid that they might get lumped in with him and the authorities might come looking for them also. But Shibli wanted to go see Mansoor and then he goes there and he sees the whole crowd is throwing rocks but yet Shibli is not throwing. Shibli is standing there and he feels threatened by the crowd saying, oh my God, they're going to think that I am with him. And what he does is he pretends to look down and, and he look, pretending to looking for a rock, but he went and goes and grabs a flower and he throws it at Mansur. Seeing that even Shibli has thrown something at him, even though a flower, Mansoor looked at Shibli and he basically said, you too, Shibli? Even you don't understand what I had experienced? Shibli was greatly disturbed by it. He realized what wrong he had done by his fear, by his, him wanting to conform to the society. He had disrespected a fellow spiritual being. And even though Shibli was not enlightened, it is said that that day he ran away and he wandered in the deserts 
wandered in the desert seeking his realization and his repentance. And eventually he discovered that dog story that I originally told you about. Beautiful people. These are beautiful, beautiful people. I am so grateful to have I had all of these people as my teachers. If you are prepared to have teachers, life becomes your teacher. I can tell you all of my life events have been my teachers. I might not have liked the life lessons I was being taught, but I was taught all of those lessons they were all for my good. They were all for my good. A good student will make everything around him his teacher. And I've had some unique teachers. My wife has been my teacher. She does not know if she, she might not think that she is my teacher, but she has been teaching me. She has been teaching me from the day we got married. She has taught me so many lessons that it's hard to even say. My children, who I used to maybe sometimes tangle with a bit, have been my teachers, teaching me. I look at my grandchildren, they're my teachers. I see them young, fresh, their minds blank, open, available. Nothing is written on them yet. And I see myself in them that I used to be like that. And then the world happened to me. I got programmed and I got conditioned by society. So when I see them, I can see what the innocence I seek. So my grandchildren are my teachers. Forget about that. My, my dog, Drake, he was my dog. He is my teacher. I remember taking him out for walks. He taught me more about love than I will like to even admit. Many times him, he is playing out there and I would bow to him for teaching me something about faithfulness, about love. Yeah. He taught me a lot. Have reverence. Allow life to become your teacher. Seek teachers. Have reverence for your teachers. Kabir, my, one of my teachers, he has a beautiful line in one of his saying, one of his uh, couplets. He says, God and my teacher, Guru, have both come to my door today. Whose feet should I touch first? Whose feet should I touch first? God's feet? or my teacher's feet. Touching feet in Indian society is a sign of great respect. It is, it is how students show respect to their teachers. So Kabir in this couplet is wondering whose feet should I touch first? Then he answers the question. He goes, I'll touch the feet of my teacher. I'll touch the feet of my guru who made it possible that I could see God. This is how important teachers are. Resonate with your teachers. Resonate with your teachers because their qualities start rubbing off on you. You know, we live in a vibrational world. We live in a vibrational world where vibrations of all these teachers who have lived before are still here. I wish you a journey of resonance with your teachers. I wish you a journey of resonance. Respect, always.